Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Alien vs. Predator Galaxy podcast, the original Alien and Predator podcast. I am co-host Adam Zeller, or as I'm known on our forums as Ridgetop, and joining me is my usual partner in crime, Aaron Percival, a.k.a. Corporal Hicks. And today we have, surprise, surprise, yet another Prey interview <laughs> for you. This is what, the fourth Fourth, one yeah, fourth. Done? Man. We have done a lot of Prey stuff this year. Um, promise we will get to some other things, but Prey was a big movie for us, so we do love it. a damn good movie. It good was. Good. It was. We're finally, like, honestly, all my time with AVP Galaxy, I don't think I've, uh, I mean, being on staff, because the first movie after I was on staff was uh, Prometheus, so I haven't felt this satisfied being with the site for a long time. So, yes, it was was a very big movie for us it makes we it love... sound like it's not fun on the website there. no i mean I've, I've just been riding off the expanded universe man i'll take what i can get in terms of the good stuff but um but yeah he so means it's... in terms of his enjoyment of the release is what he means yes um i mean the hype's always fun even oh the hype's always fun. like uh yeah. covenant the hype for covenant was so and prometheus fun. and avp and avpr i think predators anyway, was the only one i was bummed out on which well, one? And predators until the, the film actually... Predator? Oh, yeah. It didn't yeah. have too much hype. Well, to be fair, the Predator movie. didn't really either. I mean, Cause... around release, it kind of did. But anyway, we're getting into tangents again, as we do. We can't but... even get through an intro without <laughs> tangents here. Good luck. But, um, yeah, so we have another interview uh, as someone who worked on Prey. And today we are yet again, as we did the same time uh, last year, talking to Tom Woodruff Jr., one of the heads of Studio ADI, who is no longer with Studio ADI, and him and Alec have kind of diverged into, into their own creative pursuits. But this is one of the last big Studio ADI projects that they did together. So uh, we really appreciate Tom Woodruff Jr. sitting down with us yet again and dealing with our nerdy questions. Uh, so we hope you enjoy the interview. Thanks again for joining us today, Tom. So a year ago, we spoke with you about your history of performance in this franchise, of your time in the alien suit. Um, today, we'd like to focus more on the Predator side of things, namely your time on Prey. So can you tell us how this project came about for Studio ADI? We understand you were originally approached to just build the suits, but it expanded into the creative process too, taking over those duties from Aaron Sims' company. And how was... How was it distinct from what you had done with the Predator franchise before? Hmm. Well, we've had a you know obviously we've had a long uh, a, 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 a long period of of creative time spent with the with the Predator series, um, and that's if if you include or do not include my work on the original Predator when I was still at Stans, it was it was very fun, it, very very small. I think I was just doing. Uh, you know, uh, finger extensions with claws for for Kevin Peter Hall to wear as the predator and um and that was the the last i had seen of it until the avp movies came up um and at that point it was um it was very it was very exciting to take on to take on both of those franchises the alien the, the alien franchise we picked up with resurrect or alien 3 and uh, alien resurrection but then to add the the predator to it those were some pretty uh, some pretty high and mighty days because um we had big shoes to fill uh, we wanted to put our sensibilities, our our own personal sense of of of, of art and and design material into them, um, and the, the, you know, for the most part, the fans. I think the fans preferred the first AVP. Surprisingly, after after early reports were when they found out it was an R-rated movie, or was not going to be an R-rated movie, but PG-13. Um, I think a lot of them were ready to jump ship, or it did jump ship, but <laughs> I think they came around, um, and then ABPR, and then The Predator, The Predator, you know, you know with uh, um, a much smaller cast. We had uh, the, key, the key Predator, and, and then a couple of other uh, Predator-like sentries that were also involved, and that was the one Shane Black did, and then most recently now uh, Prey uh, with Dan Trachtenberg. Uh, so that's four uh, Predator movies for Studio ADI's history. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, it it was originally just to do the suits, right? For Dan, for Prey. You know, I I read that in your list of of questions, and um, 
Well, that's what Dan told us, actually. That's what Dan told you? Yeah. What Dan? What Dan's right. <laughs> Dan's right. Uh, we did. I mean, we start the process uh, um, with the designs for the for the uh, Predator, obviously, and um, and I think it happened so fast. I do, you know, I think it happened so fast where where we went back to him and said, you know, in the past we've done the weapons as well, and and he thought it over and 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 uh, uh, you know passed that part on to us as well, uh, because in in previous films we had always done the predator and the predator's armor and the predator's weapon. And because there's so much interaction, you know, with the sculpted predator body and the sculpted armor and, and weapons and everything that have to plug into it, it just, it makes so much more sense from a design and, and a, uh, a, a construction point of view to have it all coming out of one group. You know, the best communication can still get messed up. Even when we're in the shop, you know, there, there can be some misses, but, it's it's so much more um, it's much more ready to be to be a a, a, a a success if we can all be together on it. So I, I don't remember it being a long time. Um, and the Aaron Sims material this happens a lot, you know. And I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not slanting it in any kind of a negative way. Aaron Aaron Sims is you know a brilliant designer, and he's got a uh, he always has a great team of of uh, artists working for him. And a lot of times when uh, productions are gearing up, one of the first things they'll do is they'll go to, they'll want a designer. Uh, sometimes it can be so early that they want design so they can go back to the studios or back to whoever's funding the film and go, look at all this great art. And imagine how great this is gonna be in a movie. And, and Aaron is, uh, is usually approached during that phase as well as into early production more than we had ever been. You know, some of the earlier smaller movies we, were, we would design we would create, we'd go to set. But some of the bigger movies, you know, I think um, the big filmmakers and, and the big studios uh, have always, for a long time, have gone to Aaron to get uh, designs turned out. So it's kind of more like Patrick Totopoulos's pre-AVP artwork for Anderson's pitch, more like that kind of thing than um, uh, stuff to inform your create your constructive process. I, yeah, no, I believe I believe it, and again, that's that's just from my my point of view. I've not been in on that process with Aaron. You know, I've only seen him a couple of times over the years, and and never under really discussed or understood his his exact process. But you know, even on the X Men movies and um, boy, quite a few movies. A recent movie I bid on that that didn't even happen that went away. You know, they had they had some you know beautiful Aaron Sims uh, designs and. Um, they're very complete. They've got these, there's a great show quality to them, to the actual artwork than to our designs, which are sometimes rough, but sometimes if we have time, we'll pull in some, some artists to either do flat artwork or, or 3D, uh, you know, some sculptures. Okay. Understood. So we'll get this one out of the way early as well. So uh, it's something that is on a lot of fans' minds, especially after the recent social media announcement that you and Alec uh, we're parting ways and heading in different directions creatively now. So, um, you know, Studio ADI is ending. Alex got his own thing um, with Studio Gillis. Um, so where do you see yourself heading with your creative processes going well, forwards? Yeah, no, well, surprisingly, you know, when I, uh, when I was a kid and I, you know, moved out to California, it was a dream come true, and I had, you know, it's a – it was the best things and it was the worst things and it was all mixed up, but it was all, it was always great. It was always exciting and, and very pleasing to, to finally get into that, the whole genre, not just of, of monsters and creatures, but, but, you know, uh, character effects, makeups and, and special things like that. And um, it got to the point where I had always wanted to come back here. I'm living in, in the, in the state of Pennsylvania right now and I'm, I'm with close access to, you know, Philadelphia and New York, I'm like about three and a half hours away, which actually worked out well for, for the movie Smile, which was shot in New Jersey. I jumped in my car and drove two and a half hours and I was on the set. So there was something about that kind of, um, I, I, I had just gotten tired of traveling. I'd gotten tired of traveling to, uh, to different locations in different countries and, you know, in, in an effort to, to, to chase those tax credits that make these movies possible at the level they're being produced. Um, 
and I'd always, I know I always wanted to come back here, but but come back here, not as an an old man, just you know sitting down and reflecting on the movies I'd done, but still being very active in both sculpting and painting and and really design work, uh, just just to make me happy, make me feel creatively fulfilled. But I'm still trying to keep that kind of contained because I'm I'm spending more of my time now developing projects whether it's scripts or pitches and 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 I've done a lot of uh, done a lot of phone pitches um uh ever since covid uh, I haven't been in anybody's office since then and now that I'm back here you know if if it happens I would have to travel but but phone pitches with people that I know that are well established have, have always uh yielded some kind of uh, some kind of positive response I've gotten some great con con steps across to people that, uh, that 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 obviously get it um they don't get it enough yet to give me a budget and start making a movie but uh or or even a streaming series but i i have all those options and it's just been uh it's actually been been a great delight to be able to have the time to i come into my office early in the morning i work through lunch i uh, i do a couple things after lunch and then I'll do another hour or two, depending on where I'm at mentally with something. And if not, I go out in my garage and I sculpt and or, or, I, or, or I paint. And it's a, it's been a really great balance of of the creativity that I want to uh, I want to continue to to trust. Has that been a big change of pace then for you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a welcome change of pace. Welcome, a very welcome. I've looked forward to it for a long time. So. Uh, um, the decision was not hard to make. It was just the timing of the decision. So you've been on the cards for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. I'm glad to hear you, you're doing well with it. That's yeah, great. likewise. And um, something that's always been a hot topic in the world of those passionate about practical effects like us is the blending of practical and digital effects. Uh, Prey has a lot of great practical effects on display, but there are some notable digital additions over the suit and a few full body shots of a CGI predator in this. How do you personally feel about the balance of the different types of effects in Prey? Well, you know, I think there's an aspect to it all now where, where digital effects, you know, there's a lot of stunning digital effects work, work happening now, you know, has had been happening. The, 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 the planet of the apes movies after, uh, I think probably into the third one, it, it, between the third and fourth one, it started to become flawless, you know, and watching something to, to a, a, a character to that kind of design that obviously isn't a makeup and it obviously isn't a man in a suit. It's, uh, it's I, to me, it was very successful on screen to see those characters and the concept of bringing that into a film that's, that's already defined as a, as a, a practical effects approach film, um, it certainly helps, you know, it's, it's like, it's like there's these little details that, um, that help make the predator seem real without going completely digital. Then there's certain stunts and, and effects where, uh, without a digital predator that looks good, which this one did without a digital predator, the, the certain scenes, certain, certain, especially pieces of action would have to be cut back or cut altogether. So I'm all for it. You know, I'm all, I'm all for a, a uh, you know, combination of, uh, of, of, of approaches. And from your perspective, you know, being the, you know, the practical guy on this film, um, uh, you know, you, you sort of mentioned it when we spoke last uh, you know, with the effects uh, supervisor coming and introducing himself as being the laziest, um, VFX team that ever meet, uh, you'd ever meet, you know, um, we, were you sort of happy then with, with that balance in this, in this film, you didn't feel like, um, you know, it, it was overdone on top of your work too much or anything like that, you know? Yeah, I, I, no, honestly, I didn't. There was a, a couple of things that have been talked about is there's a, a scene where a shot where the predator roars and there's a lot of, we've sculpted a lot of weird hanging stuff in his mouth and, and digitally they made it, they made it sort of move and vibrate at a high frequency. Um, could we have done that? We could have done something like that. You know, if the director had come to us and said, hey, I want to do this close up at the end of the week. I want to see everything happening. We'd be sticking tubes in it or wires or, or little mechanics, something to make it, make it happen, but it would not have been as direct or as directable as, as what Dan was able to do with a, a post VFX uh, addition. And then there's also the, uh, the predator hand, right? With the, uh, the ash 
and just seeing him move his hand like that. Um, I don't think most people look at that and say, oh, you know, that's a digital effect, even though it was. But what it was, when it's something that's close, it, 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 you, didn't see a, you didn't see a predator's hand, you know, you wouldn't see the wrinkles in the glove, right? You wouldn't see um, little cracks from the latex. And, and it was also about the, the joints. I mean, we can, we can uh, extend a predator's fingertip, you know, up to here and make it that long if we want to. But the problem is that nothing up here is going to bend unless it's slaved to a movement down here. And once you have to add wires and mechanisms to do that, you start to kind of impinge on the design, the sleek, long fingers of the predator. So, again, I think that was a very, uh, a very useful visual piece to help keep the, um, the audience guessing. Yeah, we had just noticed that MPC just recently released a showreel showing like all the, the digital effects they had done for the film. And... Uh... Yeah, that one, I it was hard to tell at first if like the hand was CG. And so that that one was pretty well done, I thought. But they showed like the the practical hand that you all had built there and and their replacement of that for their show reel. It's, it's funny you say that because I kind of feel like that was one of the moments that a lot of people pointed out at. Was they were like, really? Was that one? Yeah, because, because the, it looked different to um, what we'd seen of the hand, the, the practical hands earlier. Hmm. Oh, that's right. When he has like the the medical kit, because there's kind of a close up on his hand there when he's healing himself too, yeah. I think. But that one is practical. Yeah. You know, it's it's um, it's funny to have gone this whole this run this whole route um, for me and for you know ADI basically, but for Stan, you know Stan Winston, starting with Aliens and just you know the world opens up. Uh, on Stan Winston Studios a little bit more than just Predator and, and some of his earlier films, you know, he had a handful of, of, of great hits. But on Aliens, when there was no digital option, for example, right, there was, there was in my opinion, there was so little um, detailing from the fans of, of uh, you know, well, did this rubber glove work and did this suit work and could I see... And, and the tr truth is, I think Starlock put out a magazine, uh, an Aliens magazine before the movie had opened up. And right on the cover is a picture of, of, of one of the uh, cast members wearing that. I think she's in the drop ship, right? And there's an yeah. alien hand coming around her. And it, it was one of the, it was just one of the rubber background hands we had made. There was, there was nothing, there was no expertise. There was no foam that you could do this. And it had this big dent in it like this. And I remember looking at it thinking, oh, my God, it looks like, you know, it looks like we don't know what we're doing. And, you know, what are people going to think of this? And we didn't hear anything about it then, as opposed to today where the fans are so savvy and and they're so invested in this long franchise. I think they've got a, a sense of, of ownership and they don't they don't want to be tricked. Right. They don't want to be tricked into having a digital effect. But man, anything to me is better than, than the way I felt when I saw that that thick rubber hand on the cover <laughs> of a Starlog magazine. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe we are a little too over analytical of these things. At times. Well, you know, I don't, and, and again, I'm not, I hope, I hope that's not the, uh, the feeling I'm putting out. Um, uh, the fans are over analytical uh, because they can afford to be now. I mean, afford to, in terms of access to entertainment, uh, you know, <laughs> before DVD, before VHS, you'd go in and see it. Uh, uh, you go back and see it. I remember when uh, Star Wars came out and I was I was at a great age to see Star Wars. You know, I was 18 years old and didn't know what I was walking into. And, uh, you know, there's no way to study frames from Star Wars. So I would just go back and I think I saw the movie nine times in a theater. And um, and it always caught me in the story more like I'd, I'd, I'd sort of I'd sort of stopped detail. Like like to me, the uh, that, that whole cantina band scene. I thought, you know, as, a, as an 18 year old kid uh, uh, starving for monster entertainment, I loved that. I loved everything about it. Um, you know, Rick Baker didn't know what Star Wars was when he did some work on it. He just knew it was some science fiction, you know, outer space movie. And uh, what a great surprise. Uh, but back then, you know, compared to now when you can get uh, Blu-ray and you can, you can, you know, download it and you can stop on single frames, uh, the fans do have that access to 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 fully involve themselves in in what happened on screen. 
it does make it does make it fun for us as well. Yeah, you know, I, I, the, I still remember pausing on VHS with all the friggin' scan lines to you know the point where we're at now where I can frame by frame it, like you say, to catch that one specific I, clear moment. I I used to do that. I used to do that on television. If a uh, if a Ray Harryhausen movie was on television back in the whew, what was it uh, mid seventies. I would set up my Super 8 camera on a tripod and I would just oh, shoot two and a half minutes of a, of a Ray Harryhausen animation, even though it had the, those weird scan lines that would just keep coming up across it. It didn't matter. It was the closest thing I could get. Oh, that, that's ghetto, that is. That's that's <laughs> like holding holding up the uh, the radio um, recorder to the radio and, um, you know, hitting recorders. <laughs> yeah, it is. It. Yeah, that's good. Oh, man. Um, so, um, back to practical. Um, you know, one one of the notable differences with feral suit to how you, you know, did all your other predators was in how Dane's head was in the neck. You know, something that you know you'd done previously with all the aliens um, suits. Mm-hmm. And so, why why this change? Because it seems like a really big change in terms of how the predators you know were constructed and performed yeah it it, it is it, it is a big change you know it's, it was something we also after aliens it was something we did for pumpkin head we had you know my face down in the neck and that that gave us the opportunity to not see a person's neck and a head and, and the uh the head could tilt you know back here instead of down here but for for the feral predator it was done primarily to be able to come up with a much smaller predator head, you know, on set. Um, the predator heads have been have been really big and, and they've established the predator and, and, you know, not knocking them, they are what they are, but like, uh, like Dan said, let's, you know, let's do what we can to make this look like a separate, a different breed or, or a different generation or, or just something that isn't just the same predator uh, revisited. And, you know, to make that head smaller, we had to have Dane, you know, tilt his head down so that we could hide the face here and hide his neck under the skin of the of the predator's neck and some costuming, some some armor. Um, but that was the whole point, and and it was, it, I thought it was highly successful. I was I was actually delighted to see the uh, the early tests where we we three D printed Dane's head and we three D printed a sculpture a 3D sculpture that Michael Epinette had done for us and found out, you know, where we're going to fit Dane's head into this predator head. And um, it was tight, uh, including servos that had to go into it. Um, it was very tight, but um, wow, I just, I think it worked out great to be able to have that. When you line all the predators up, there's something very distinct and, and very almost unnatural about seeing the latest predator, which storyline is, is probably the earliest predator that that uh, we'll ever see from that from that uh, creature world so it, it was more about dan wanting to just make it a smaller head then it, it wasn't any technical um... no tech no tech technically it was a challenge uh, <laughs> uh for but for dan from the the storytelling point of view it was a uh, it was it was again a reason to underline and, and enhance the fact that this was was a whole Different. new breed of predator. Okay. Did it actually make it easier for you then, having to not worry about all the you know the servos and the mechanics around a performer's you know directly around a performer's head? Did did that free it up for you in terms of construction? Oh, uh, a little bit, but not as much as you would think. It was there was still a lot of tight packaging of uh, of servos in in the space that was left you know, back here that would have been the back of Dane's head. Now we had a little bit more room, but again, we kept wanting to compress this, you know, we would do sketches and, and Dan would say, well, kind of compress it a little bit more. And we go back to our 3d work and find out what we could do to, to allow some room. Luckily, uh, luckily the, the electric, ser- electric servos are, are much smaller than they were back in the, uh, the late seventies, the early eighties. Um, so th- that certainly helped out too. the advances that were made in the, the, uh, the technical tools. And with the advent of, um, 
you know, things like digital scanning and, and 3D printing now, do you find that that's, that's really kind of changed the game a bit in the world of practical effects? I think, it, oh, I think absolutely it has, especially when, when build schedules, you know, have gone from six months to, to, uh, uh, you know, four months. Uh, um, if, if we had to work all of that out, you know, in the sculpting room, you know, with light casts and everything, um, it would take a lot longer to complete any one direction before, before it was complete enough to either say yes or throw it away and start all over it. With the 3D world, you know, you can just turn things around and push this here or push this here. And it's it's so much faster, but also in terms of design, it just it just feels a lot cleaner because you're uh, you're not limited by you're not limited by your tools or your materials. So here's one of those fun. Uh, I don't I won't say nitpick questions, but um fan theory i guess kind of questions so you know something i've seen people point out is a apparent similarity between the feral predators absolutely fucking phenomenal bone mask can i just say easily one of my favorite masks from the series um and the skull of the river ghost creature you know the alien introduced in um, nimrod antal's predators number three was that a conscious similarity or was that a coincidence? I think it was a, well, I, I don't know because it wasn't, it wasn't our, uh, it wasn't our plan. It wasn't, I, I, I purposely, maybe to my detriment, I purposely have stayed away from the novelizations, from the graphic, from the comics, right. Of the, of the alien and predator world, because I didn't want to be, um, what is it? I, I didn't, I didn't want to hold on to something subconsciously, you know, and just, and, and, pick it up and take it. Uh, in this case, uh, Dan is, is he's up on, on so much of that stuff. So he may, well, this was a film, Tom, What's this that? Was a film. Yeah. Nimrod Antal's predators, the third film. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course that had all, uh, all the different, all the different predators, right? Yes. Well, this was a, a, a non predator alien creature that was also on that planet that the, the group of characters had run into. Um, and yeah, the, the, it has kind of an exoskeleton look about it. And some fans were thinking it just looked really similar to the, the mm -hmm. feral predators bone mask. I always figured that was probably just a coincidence, but I mean, well, let's say I can, I can send, <laughs> I can send you a picture actually, if you want to. Oh yeah, but yeah, sure. Because it, it, it's funny. Cause I saw the film and, and I don't, I honestly don't, uh, no surprise. There's a lot of things I'm forgetting. <laughs> so, actually, no, I say, I say I've remembered them. I've just forgotten how to get to the memories. <laughs> it's so funny. Had we not been talking about this and had you sent this to me, I would have said, wow, cool monster. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have recognized it from the movie, which is, which is weird. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a brilliant piece of work. I think what, um, probably one of the big differences is, is that the head of this, of this river ghost is taller than the head on, uh, um, on the prey predator, you know, somewhat, it's a, it's a more vertical thing. Um, but I don't know, you know, what, what, what was the challenge if, if, uh, it, whether or not Dan had seen that and, or subconsciously or whatever, um, it gets to the point where there's, there's so many, there's only so many things that you can do to a predator to, to change him up from what's been done, but not lose the essence of what a predator is. And I think anybody that sees our film for the, all the differences, the, the visual and differences and performance differences, it's still a predator. So, Oh, um, 100%. Yeah. 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 So, but, it's, I, 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 so, you know, I think that's, um, I think that's very cool to be able to, to find something like that, 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 that defines a whole world. It's interesting, but I can't remember who, whether it was you or whether it was Alec, but I think in one of the previous things, um, one of you had talked about how we like, you know, fans like to try and make all these connections. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know I didn't personally think that it was an intentional crossover, but I was like, well, I've got to ask for a start, but yeah, it is, it is so fans just trying to make everything, um, yeah. Connected. Well, you know, again, you, you, you have to, I do, I have to appreciate the fans. And I guess to them, I would say um, anything that seemed similar was not intentional. Um, to me, it was all a growth from, from creating a new predator creature and a new predator head and a new predator mask that was unlike anything we had seen before. 
uh, and directed by Dan to to look like a bone, you know, go to a bone mask. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know that. I, you know, again, short answer: No, it wasn't. A, it, it wasn't planned. I think it's something that just evolved from um, something out in the ether. You know, where certain certain looks and certain effects are are uh, <laughs> are met. I mean, other people have compared it to specific Wendigo artwork as well. Which would which would have been interesting had that been intentional, but you know Dan also told us you know he didn't want to go down that route. Um, but re- regardless, it's a fucking good mask. It yeah. really is. Hmm. And now that prey's been out, we've been treated to a lot of behind the scenes concept art for the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was interesting to see that the Predator character went through a few earlier iterations before landing on the final design that we see in the film. Uh, which from what we understand was largely based on the conceptual work of Michael Vincent. Uh, how did Studio ADI and director Dan Trachtenberg arrive at this final look for The Predator? Um, sorry, just say the last part again. I so just how how was it that you had decided on this final design with Dan Trachtenberg, that Michael Vincent's uh, design, this is the one we want? Yeah, Michael Michael Vincent Epinet, that's who you mean, right? He, he, he was a, uh, is that who you meant? Um, Maybe Let's I don't know if I'm Michael Vincent, but I know if I'm Michael Vincent Empanet. Um, yeah, I mean this this yeah you know, yeah that's that's the yeah, same guy. He's, yeah. he's a uh, he's a brilliant three D three D artist. You know he he, he creates in three D. Um, we used him quite a bit. We we actually had come to him at, at a step at a step not at the end. You know we hadn't designed everything, but we came to him with with sort of the the, the works of of what we. We're going to put what we knew were going to be part of the character, and by that time, I had split off to do weapons with Farzad, and and Alec had split off with Michael to to develop that head in a way that we would have a great looking um, 3D sculpt that we could then print in house and do final detailing on. And again, a lot of that was in an effort of showing show me five different versions of this predator head without having to sculpt them without it, with with Michael just kind of burning the midnight oil and, and just going in, in one, two, three, and making some changes, but we were all in the same world. That that made it the next day where you're able to go back to Dan and say, which of these do you want to progress with or which of these do you want to say it's done and we should move forward? So um, he's he's very fast. Uh, he has a great attitude and he's a great collaborator. Yeah, I really liked when the film first came out, he started posting more of his concept art that that he had done with you guys. And uh, he would go into some like lore justifications of why it looks the way it does. Oh, it lives on this part of the planet. So it was interesting to see him just kind of, uh, as you say, fans can be over analytical, but him kind of going into that world and, and being like, well, here's my explanation for why it is the way it is, why it is different. It's so funny because uh, um, the same thing with Farzad. The same, I think. Um, who did we else do? Justin Gobi Fields and Justin Joseph did some work. I, I love that. The, I love that the um, production designers. I don't know if it's something that's a it's a learned thing or it's a taught thing, but but they don't just do drawings. They don't like. They will. It's, it's exactly like Adam just said that they will say. Well, this big long bone here is is used to do this, and 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 not to justify, uh, to slide it by, but to say, oh, I get it. It's if if in my mind, uh, as a director, certainly in producers, I think if they understand that there's a reason for things and they're not so haphazard, I think it helps to to strengthen the creature character in the real world of of the movie, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um... Speaking of some of those earlier concepts too, Kyle Brown did a number of uh, Predator pieces. Um, I believe was he with you guys at the time too? Like, hmm. I think Kyle works for Aaron. Yeah, oh, I don't really? Think Kyle, oh, okay. I don't think Kyle was on our team. Gotcha. Okay, so those were the air, earlier concept arts mm-hmm. then. So we love the performance of Dane Delegro as the Predator, and we had him on a, as a guest recently for our podcast. He had told us how much of a challenge this role for him was that it was brutally hot in the suit during the shoot. Uh, Did this particular shooting in a remote location with the excessive summer heat create additional challenges for your team with the suit? And did you give Dane much coaching considering your history with the suit performance as the alien character? You know, I think what we went through in Calgary 
was was still uh, better, still more humane than what Kevin Peter Hall went through in, in Mexico on the first movie. Um, it was very hot, uh, but it was very dry. Um, it was rough terrain, you know, Dane had, had some of his vision was obstructed, you know, looking out through holes under the jaw. Um, and he did do it. He did do an amazing job. I know he's done other suit stuff, but I don't know that he had ever done anything that had this long of a run, you know, of, of whatever, eight weeks, 10 weeks of doing all of this suit stuff. Um, and, and he's such an enjoyable guy to be around. He's just, he's just such a positive positive guy and he's a uh, and he so loves to uh, what, what's that he's what's so that? damn enthusiastic yeah the enthusiasm and it's and it's all it's all it's all real you know it's all very real he's not just he's not just putting it on to earn his next job but um no i grew to like him very fast and uh, and and uh and i would <laughs> i would tease him <laughs> the greatest thing i think the first time we had him in full suit we got to, we, we jumped in a van and we took him up on the, the hill on the setting where uh, where Dan was shooting, and uh, and and Dane is just bubbling like a little kid. Well, what, what should I do? Should I do this? And should I should I turn this way? Blah, 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 blah. And I uh, and I just <laughs> still laughs about this. I didn't say a thing. I just turned to him and said, he goes, what, what's what's the best thing to do? And I just turned to him and say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> He sees me now. I think we'll say that. <laughs> it was so funny because just for a second he thought, he thought, was that was that a real thing? But uh, no, it was great. He's uh, he's he's brilliant. Uh, I didn't have to give him much performance, much performance, many performing notes because he already had that the whole thing down. He was comfortable in the suit and the amount of movement that it still provided and vision. Uh, he did a uh, he did an excellent job. So just kind of rolling back a little bit but also relevant because i'm curious now just thinking about it with the head in the neck thing is that common in terms of suit design creature design or would that not have been something you might have had very specific experience with with the alien compared to some of the, like the other predator performers well i think i don't know if i mentioned but but, but for us you know when uh when Alec and I were still at stands, it, uh, it was the approach we used for the aliens in Aliens <laughs> and uh, Pumpkinhead. Was it really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there's video oh. out there of me in the Pumpkinhead suit. Uh, it's funny. We, you know, cause at that point, Stan had moved to directing and he wasn't there on a day to day job. So he turned all the design and build over to us. But having come, you know, uh, uh, hot off of aliens, we thought there were techniques that worked so well, including the, the what we call the trash bag queen, uh, right? And you've seen pictures of that, right? I've seen the test footage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, sadly enough, I, I keep going to some of the uh, to some of the companies that are, that uh, are getting licensing to do to do characters, and I want somebody to do a trash bag queen. <laughs> but um, awesome. no, then we did so we did a, a trash bag pumpkin head. Um, we wrapped the head. We had a head form where we wrapped black cloth and we shot it all backlit and, uh, and we loved it. Stan loved it. So, so that was the reason we, we got a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a, of a call out from the fans, you know, way before, uh, way before they could just sit at home and, and do it on their keyboard. But, um, yeah, someone said, 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 Oh, you just, it's the same thing you did with the alien, you know? And yes, that's right. In, in the in interior, you know, the head is down and, and there, but from the outside, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't proceed to the outside it doesn't stick out as, as, as evidence of how it was done. It's just, here's an interesting creature with a big head and a long neck and, and where's the human head inside. Um, that to me is the success of it. And, and, and I don't know that I've seen, I'm sure they're out there. You know, there's so many shops um, doing these things and, and so many creature artists doing these things. I'm, I, I know there's, there's got to be more characters built around that that concept uh, that, that went into characters in movies and movies and streaming. And Feral was a pretty unique design uh, when compared to previous Predators. How do you land on the right balance of familiar and new when designing the next iterations of these well-known characters? Do you feel that audience or fan expectations can sometimes be creatively limiting? Hmm, that's interesting. It, it, you know, we certainly don't want to disappoint the fans, but we certainly can't um, we can't rope them all in, you know, and make them all happy about everything. 
um, in, in a movie, particularly in a movie like this, you know, it's 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 great to be able to turn all the attention to the director, you know, where where Dan can establish the you know the approach or the thing. One of the first things he said was, uh, "I want to see, I want to see what a predator looks like that is is inhumanly skinny, you know, tall and super lean and skinny." And and at the same time, he wasn't ready to give up on the the bigger, beefier uh, type of predator. So. One of our earliest tests was um, Alec found, um, I think there was still a predator suit that was left from, from AVPR, I think. Um, it wasn't in great shape, this stuff just doesn't last, but he pulled that down, they made some repairs on it. Alec had already found Dane. Um, had Dane come in, I, uh, I have a, a son who's uh, he's six foot, who at the time six foot three, I think, and super skinny. And he had been doing some character stuff. And I got a, uh, we cut, made a custom leotard for him. And then we did a lot of, uh, of digital printing onto the spandex of like a predator color and, and, and uh, uh, body details, you know, all printed on this spandex thing. So when we put that on him and we had a, I think we had, a, they shared a, a stunt head. Uh, he was super tall and he was super skinny. But next to Dane, it was very easy to see that, that we don't want to go in that design. We don't want to go in that direction of the, of the super skinny version now. It's always great to try it. I always, I always think it, it's a benefit if you have a, a couple of different ways to go that you quickly weed out the ones that aren't working so that you can focus full force on, on getting the other ones to the point where they're, they're the correct way to go. Yeah, it's just interesting, the contrast between... Um, say the wolf predator that you all did which was very lean um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the feral predator which was more uh defined but also very i would say um uh like still very agile in his movement but maybe not quite as as slim and lean as as wolf was yeah um, i think that's i think that's very accurate he was uh he, you could definitely tell that he had the muscles to to get around and to do the things that he was doing um, on screen, you know, purposely on screen. Um, and I do think that there's a there's a certain look. I know on Wolf, um, he was very lean. Um, it was fun to go in that direction, you know. Again, something different. He was very lean, and 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 uh, when we got to this one, um, Joey Orozco, who who did the sculpting of the body, was being very methodical. In, in matching, you know, what the size of, of Dane's arms were, his real arms, and then putting, you know, making an exact sheet, uh, exact size sheet of clay, thickness of clay, and he would just start wrapping the Dane body sculpture in that. So whatever was built up was symmetrical. And I think that also helped, you know, that, that very specific balance of symmetry also helped to make it look like a, like a complete and, and, uh, and, and well thought out design. After um, working on the Predator, did you find it a bit refreshing um, that compared to that one where you had built Fugitive Predator, which much more traditional looking Predator, that this one you were given a bit more creative freedom to try something that was uh, a bit more pushing the boundaries of, of what we had traditionally known as a Predator? Yeah, no, we were very lucky to, that, 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 that Dan, you know, that, that Dan gelled well with us because it would have been very easy to say, look, Tom and Alec have done these and 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 you know these are very similar and we, i want something very new um it's it's not at all unheard of to have a, a production come together and say we want to start over from the very beginning and we want to use people that have never done this this type of creature before so in a way we were very lucky that that uh, that dan took us on you know and and saw that we were flexible because had somebody else put this design together and would have looked very similar i'm sure to what what dan was directing um, there would be a great feeling that uh, that uh, oh ADI dropped the ball or or they they couldn't uh, they couldn't turn the ship around they could only do a predator one of two or three different ways so so that is something I think that uh, Alec and I were both very thankful for that, that that Dan saw flexibility in us and in our work over the years that uh, that he entrusted us with the new design. So this is something you, you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, you guys took on, much like the AVPs, you know, you guys did the weaponry and the equipment, um, something you didn't get to do on, on the Predator, if I remember rightly. 
Um, so with with that kind of process, you know, where you're just knocking it out there, how how much you because as I understand it, you know, you the concepts you come up with for like the weaponry, so like the the whip from AVPR, you know that that wasn't that was you guys, wasn't it? That wasn't in the script, right? So how how much you? Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Aaron. I mean, it was it was us. It was not in the script in the early script, at least. And I don't remember if it showed up in any of the later scripts, but it was it was definitely something that uh, that came from uh, from the uh, the brothers, the you know, to to, uh, um, to have a different kind of weaponry. I just remember kind of popping up a little bit into the build schedule. So you're right in that it wasn't. It was on the very first list of things to build, and it sort of developed during the, the Strauss brothers' uh, uh, time with the movie. Okay, well, that, that may completely invalidate what I'm going to ask you then, because I was just going to say, you know, how um, how how much of what was in the film was your guys' concepts for equipment, um, and was there anything that was explored that didn't make it in there? Mm, you, you mean in the new movie or yeah in pride in pride yeah no it's it's it, like all of these we're um well all of these with the exception of the predator uh where you know there's a certain number of weaponry called out for in the story and and we break that down and um i think um, alec at this time was running moving forward with the predator so i took on the weaponry and some of the armored uh, tools that he had to use and um, in order to do that, you know, again, like we would do with the creature, we, we design it in a very loose way and we talk about it and we get together with some of uh, the, the, the uh, illustration artists that we've used in the past. Again, like, you know, Farzad and, and, and uh, um, you know, Justice Joseph worked on some of these weapons too. Justin Gobi Fields did. And the thing that was what was fun about it was early on. We were, I, I was going towards the idea of making the, 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 uh, the weapons look more primitive. Um, Dan said he didn't want the double shoulder cannon mounted up here, you know, which makes sense because that's a very specific look of the Predator uh, franchise. We wanted something different. And, and, it, and so in my mind, that meant however long ago this was, you know, however, whatever, whatever, whatever the time period was back then, the Predator's weapons, I would think, would also look like they haven't really been developed. You know, they wouldn't be super, super shiny and glossy, but they would have, and that's where the element of the bones, you know, and the gauntlet came out to be able to match the, the, the bone mass. Um, we were going so rough as to, um, we had some weapons that were designed that actually had uh, like camouflage leaves and things attached to it, which, um, which, which was an interesting look, but it certainly didn't, didn't it, it melt, made it feel like it was some kind of a jungle movie or you know a, a, a something that happens on a tropical island um so we got away from that and and we ultimately did go back with weapons that i thought were were very unique um in a different way you know the um what do we call it the um well like the shield for example is a very high-tech thing okay um the cross bolt gun is a very high-tech thing um if they had been done in a traditional predator style, would they? They probably uh, they probably be shinier, and they might be a little bit bolder. Um, but um, in the in the end, the predator's weapons and his armor are a little bit more simple than than what has been seen. But uh, but certainly not. Um, I think that's the one thing where where Dan didn't want to go as far in his concept and have the predator show up with a, a bunch of. Uh, crappy looking <laughs> weapons and and tools that don't work because you can only go you you, you know you can only make him so um so uh, uh prehistoric but the truth is he also is from the world of a technology where you can fly around space in an invisible spaceship so he's he's either got it or he doesn't have it so we did we did kind of kind of shoot somewhere between those two ends well that 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 conflict of of primal and primitive and tribal and sophisticated is, is is one of the appealing parts of the character but i also imagine it must be incredibly difficult to balance that properly when you are coming up with you know new um new equipment and new technology like that but i mean the, the things in prey you know the shield in particular um you know its deployment is so incredibly sophisticated and um actually reminded me a little bit of stargate which meant i loved it a lot um because of the 
metamorphosizing kind of metal kind of look of it. And yeah, that is incredibly sophisticated, but the concept of a shield is so primitive, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um, I love that. I, I really love the shield. Um, and, and the crossbow, you know, that as well, you know, it, the, this detailing on the handle that makes it feel like the, the combi sticks, which is, um, right, maintains yeah, yeah. that, maintains that predator feel while again, still being something new, but yep. something very basic in primitive in concept, you know, it's, it flings a bolt, um, very sophisticatedly flings a bolt, but you know, it is, it is just a literal <laughs> just chunk of metal. So, you know, that is a, a very appealing part of the character, but I imagine it makes things very interesting for you guys. I think the, um, I think the biggest thing in terms of the design, I mean, once the design is there and then we hit the build and then we start working it into the predator's arsenal, you know, on a day to day shooting basis, I think the designs, I think, I, I think when you're designing, you keep, you, you keep, you hope you're designing like this, right. And you're going to come to a point where, ah, this is, this is the exact answer, but I don't think it's like that. I think when you're designing something like this, this might be a little different because there, there are certain elements that you want to continue with the predator, uh, 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 build, you know, predator body and tools, but but I think I think designs come like this, and then I think they they does that make sense that they I don't think there's a single peak where you look at something and go, that's perfect and it will never get any better. So what happens is you keep trying, keep moving, 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 and then you know Dan will say, oh, I'll go back in this way and go back in this, and you get to a point where you go, you know what, if this thing's going to be ready to shoot three or four weeks from now, we need to start building it. And that's, that allows you to get, and that in itself, in itself becomes the, the pinpoint of, of how good it could be because you've also got to take into account the, the aspect of, of time. Yeah. Reality sets in. Mm. Yeah. And speaking a bit more about um, that piece of weaponry, um, you had it listed as the crossbolt, Aaron, but wasn't it called the bolt gun? It was, it, it, yeah, it was the, uh, it started as a crossbolt gun, which was more of a traditional crossbolt, but it had, I think it had three, I, I think it had three things that would mechanically pull back that he would load his, um, his little uh, bolts into, and he'd fire it that way. Um, but then that became less of a, um, uh, you know, let, uh, it became it became less of a cross bolt and and it was soon just a gun that would shoot these these heavy bolts that um, you know like a bolt gun that you would use uh, uh, what was the movie uh, um, No Country for Old Men was that the thing uh, oh yes, yes. that was wicked I never seen it. I never imagined anything like that but uh, yeah I think that's what that's what where it, where it was that was simplified to make it you know less superfluous with movements of the of the uh, of the weapon. Hmm. Yeah, that was that was kind of um, a well known and well liked weapon within the fandom. We had kind of known it as the spear gun before, but in some of the comics and games, we had seen like these handheld spear guns uh, that the predators were using. And uh, hmm. I think a lot of us may have been expecting to see something more obviously inspired by a traditional bow and arrow, like the Comanche tribe was hmm. was using. In one of the recent Predator video games, uh, they just straight up have a predator bow and arrow that's um very similar to that you know taking these human weapons like an avpr you have the whip a very human weapon that was given a very predator-like spin Mm -hmm. um so we were curious if that direction was ever explored was there ever more of a traditional bow and arrow kind of weapon for the predator or was it always this more handheld initially initially it was never a straight bow and arrow but there you know and the aspects of of putting pressure by pulling a cable this way and having two two sprung things that want to you know, uh, send it forward. Uh, very early concepts or very early sketches. There were uh, script elements. There was a, there was an aspect of a weapon like that, but never as a pure bow, bow and arrow, or nothing as as pure as a uh, as a uh, um, what was it? Uh, I don't know. I know the bow and arrow thing definitely was was dropped, but but uh, I don't know. Yeah, it was just it was just an element of of wanting to have something that was different. Um, and not uh, again. I didn't. I, I had not seen any evidence of that because uh, I wasn't looking into some of the, the comparable storytelling elements of the of the predator world, like uh, magazines or movies. <laughs> so you you mentioned the the bone 
um, inlays in like the gauntlet and stuff like that um, is a uh, kind of like a design continuity, I guess, with the mask is in the rest of the equipment. Yeah, there were absolutely. Yes, there were elements of that. I think that there were some bone elements on some of the weapons as well. Um, but it was something, you know, just just to give the idea that um, that that the predator had somewhat limited access to whatever whatever unique tools supplies that he was going to use and and certainly you know bone is great because that goes you know historically that goes back to the beginning of life you know where prehistoric men would fight you know bones would be among among their uh, among their tools among their weapons um, so that was a nice i just thought that was a very nice element to come in on those on those gauntlets you know, and have something that ties it together. I thought that was very important. So that's kind of like a homemade spin to it then. That's... Say that again, like a what? A homemade spin to the Predator's weaponry. Yeah, that was part of it, sure. Like he, he, uh, it wasn't all shiny and, and made out of some some beautiful uh, alloy. It was, it was definitely a hand-constructed thing. Okay. I don't think I've heard that one before in terms of the behind-the-scenes of the film, so that's actually quite interesting. Um, I like that. Um what was I actually thinking? Oh, uh, the the mask. So Adams, you know, said we've seen all this awesome behind the scenes stuff and it's some of the most fun part of a film's release for nerds like us. Um, the red glow. What was that mm. about? And why did why did Dan decide not to use that? You mask? know what? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. All of his decisions were sound. Um, I don't think this was any difference. I just don't know what the decision was because it was uh, it was a very awesome <laughs> Very awesome looking effect. Um, we even had the ability to to uh, to ramp the power up and back, you know, to make it kind of pulse. And uh, okay, um, I think there was talk of it of it being a, a visual element of of when he's when he's stalking somebody. I, 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 there was definitely something to tie in, so it wasn't just hey, look, a neat effect. But in the end, and obviously, you know, it was built and it worked. Uh, but in the end, it just trying to think if there was any of it there was none of it in the movie right no it, yeah. it wasn't in at all and there was talk about enhancing it with uh there was some shots because there was talk about enhancing it with digital but um i don't know there, there were things that were happening on set that i wasn't uh, uh privy to but at one point we found out that we wouldn't ever be turning it on well i kind of just interpreted it as like in the the earlier predator films where you'd see like the eye flash right like in I know wolf wolf size flash and you had the yellow eye flash in the original. So I was like, maybe mm. it was supposed to be like that. Like his mask sensors are doing stuff or whatever, but yeah, you, you no, you're right. in as much as it had more of a reason than a, than a neat decoration, I would check with studio Gillis on that. So out of all the predator characters that you've worked on uh, with studio ADI, do you have a personal favorite? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, you know, because, because for me, I have a hard time separating the final character on screen from the experience of designing it and building it and working out all the problems and just the up and down, you know, success, failure, success. It's hard for me to just pull the character out. I love, I, I absolutely love the feral predator. Um, I, I think partially because it's new and, and, and like I had mentioned, it was, it, to me, it was a, uh, it was a great gift from from Dan Trachtenberg to to invite us into this world one more time, and, and I thought it was so successful. Very proud of it. But there was also an, an element of the um, the first move, or the first ABP movie in in working, you know, uh, with Paul Anderson to come up with looks, and and that was such a uh, that was really a delightful set we shot in Prague. And and I know, you know, people are going to go, I don't care where you shot. What about designing the creature? But like I said, it was all part of one big aspect. And that was really a, a great time. So I love that one as well. Okay. Well, that is actually everything from Adam and I. But before we sign off, we do have a couple of questions submitted by the um, members mm. of the AVP Galaxy community. Okay. So um, Aaron Lee Peck. Would like to know as you're moving on to focus more on your own creative endeavors you know um developing and directing your own uh, projects i think this one's a bit obvious one and i'm sure you were probably expecting this but um have you considered or would you consider doing an alien or predator film and if so would you what ideas would you like to explore 
And uh, <laughs> this little addition's from Adam. I can I can tell that. Um, have you made the pitch for Alien Salvation to 20th Century yet? Uh, okay, let's see. Well, to answer the questions, um, I, I would have. Oh, yes, absolutely. Would I want to be involved? Absolutely. If you know, if 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 this was a different world, if this was the world of the 80s, where where um, you you a, a creature designer, creature maker gets to a, a chance to direct, like Stan Winston, like. Uh, uh, Tom Berman, like, like a, a lot of people don't realize David Fincher's one of his early jobs was on uh, working on uh, uh, Star Wars, uh, setting up the little gas explosions inside the Death Star that, uh, that uh, you know, but, 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 but obviously it's not the way it is because there are so many people out there, you know, with, with great directing credential that it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to get to that point. If I had the opportunity, yes, absolutely yes. Have I pitched? Have I pitched my Alien Salvation? Um, uh, no, I haven't. I've, I've lightly pitched it to a couple of people, but um, the idea now that uh, that Fox uh, is moving forward with a film and a series, it, it seems like the uh, like that card is pretty full. And I don't know, you know, my my whole idea behind Alien Salvation was, and I've already brought this up. I mean, let me know if I'm just repeating myself. But the whole idea was to to close, to have a final chapter, you know, so it was all a complete world, a complete, uh, a complete story. I don't, I'm not finding uh, people, you know, at Fox um, that have the same, the same kind of love of, of that original series because it had its ups and downs. Not everybody loved Alien 3 when it came out. And, uh, but the truth is, you know, I think the fans would love it. It's just trying to get the idea to someone who, who, who believes in that as well. I think Ridley's got a big hand in the creative decisions as well now. And I think f the whole thing with Fede's film came came through Ridley. Yeah, I think so too. Well, there was a point too where where um they were there was talk about moving forward with an alien, but saying that Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection never existed, you know, and kind of circumventing yeah. that. Um so that would that would take a lot of the wind out of the sails of, of completing that storyline yeah. as a linear as a linear story um, how about um avp do you think it'd be a good time to bring that back oh. i think they <laughs> I always have to ask but my answer is the same as aaron's <sighs> <laughs> so maybe not quite yet <laughs> maybe not yet <laughs> maybe not yet you see, now it's funny, Adam, because you say that, and uh, uh, you know, if this was just a you know, crazy dream world for me, and, and, and somebody called up tomorrow and said, You want to direct a, a new AVP movie? Oh, of course, it's the only thing that makes sense. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't feel like they'll, they'll give AVP the budget to be done how people want it to be done, yeah. um, you know, which is which is why we got what we got but i mean to be fair to anderson to be fair to the guys at prague that film looked a hell of a lot more expensive than it was the production design on that pyramid was yeah. phenomenal yeah yeah there was some very very really brilliant stuff in that movie i'll still just keep hoping for a third someday because I, I like those that. movies so I'd like a reboot but i'd like a reboot more in line with the comics you know mm. I, I want i want it to be Leaning more on the alien side with a splash of predator in there, and I just I, I don't see it happening in a live action yeah. form at the minute. But we'll see. We, we can hope. <laughs> Should I say right. rather? Let me, another... let me let me know if you're hearing this. <laughs> and another community question from uh, Aaron Skolnick, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, he has a question. Uh, we've been seeing a little. See. on and off lately that's oh, my yeah. that's okay. my uh... we've been seeing a little on and off lately um and that is do you have any universe ideas for how in the universe predator... oh my god i really fucked that one up do you have any um do you have an idea for how the predator backpack stays attached like in the actual world of predator i guess as opposed to just the <laughs> oh, that's but... very good uh that's very good i know that uh I know that in, in our actual world, it, uh, it ranged from cable ties to very strong magnets. <laughs> uh, the predator world, I, I don't know. I don't know that it was ever discussed. I think that's kind of one of those, those things that where you see it and well, it obviously somehow it all obviously worked and I can't explain it, you know? Um, I haven't, I haven't heard much kickback about that, to be honest with you. So I, I don't think there was ever an answer, at least not at, 
not at my level of 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 how the the predator's backpack works. Yeah, it's it's not one I'd ever really thought about before, and it's just one which I've seen crop up a lot recently in in regards to to practice. It's a fair it's a fair question because it's uh because there are times too it's sort of like the uh, you know the the backpack somehow comes off and then opens. And it's just got, you know, a dozen things in there. And and we really worked to make sure that there was room for everything. We didn't want it to be a magical case. The predator just pulls things out all the time, right? No so We made sure all those uh, discs fit and we made sure this gun fit and everything. So so it, it, we were, I think we were well tuned in with the reality of what we saw on screen. But we never did see the predator you know, either wrestle with getting that thing off of his back or have a some smooth way of disconnecting it. That's fair. So Blue Marsalis uh, 79 asks if there was much communication between you guys and MPC in regards to, you know, the suit being augmented and, and the how no, and the look of it. it. No, there wasn't because early on, um, there was an entire library of, of, uh, of images taken with Dane fully suited up all the way around, completely, you know, completely scanned uh, close up of the gloves and the feet. Every weapon was scanned so that that there was there were times on set where they come to us and say, hey, can we scan the, the, the uh, shield today? We said, well, we can't because we're shooting it. But then the next day we could take it over. So there was that crossover, I think, in that in that we helped provide our pieces on set to be scanned and used by by various uh, by various uh, digital artists and sizzy bubbles asks if there were any other unused concept designs for prey that you wish were kept in the film hmm. no i like to believe that uh i mean when more time has passed and i look back on it i'm sure i will find things like i've done in some of the other movies we've done not just the alien and predator movies but it's kind of nice to go back to all the old designs of some movie and and look at stuff and remember what was so great about it and, and it always has a fresh look to it. Uh, so they're they're out there, but at this point in time, I, I don't have I don't have any uh, feeling that there were there were stronger concepts or stronger assortment of of designs that that work any better than what we ended up with. Is there any particular effect? that you did you guys did work on in, in prey that you think turned out really fucking good any, any I, more, I, well, other than all of it shall i say, yeah, so, I'm gonna say any, any, anything in particular that you are proud of very proud i was of. okay this is this is uh um i i don't want to undercut the, the question it's a very fair question um not not me the, the one thing i again delighted in because of the some of the backstory was the uh when the predator comes across or not so not the predator when the Comanches come across the skinned rattlesnake that's still alive, um, that was something that that was that was fun between uh, uh, between Dan and me because we were looking. We I, I went online looking for some snake skin because we wanted to incorporate that into his his dressing, you know, his armor. And there was a whole section on these skinned snakes that were still alive, still in plastic, the heads cut off, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, their system is so so weirdly advanced that they can stay alive and seriously just go on just go on youtube and and uh, i saw this and i sent i sent some links to dan i said i can't believe this is real he loved it and he said well let's do that so making that uh, making that pink skin snake just kind of undulating in the in the dirt to me was was uh, was gleefully exciting <laughs> Yeah, and it looked great on screen too. It's fine, creepy. Dan, Dan spoke about that moment actually. Um, as a holy shit, I'm working with Tom Woodruff moment. So uh, he 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 quite enjoyed that one as well. Yeah, that was fun. That was great fun. And that's it, Tom. That's everything. You've made it through yet another sit down with us. So thank wow. you for that. Um, remind remind me of this. If if there's if there's another predator sometime that we do another sit down that we're counting that we're counting how many times we've gotten together. I think it's, this it's, is the third third or fourth. Mm. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, the first time I came out and visited you two in 2017, I believe, and you you and Ali gave me a tour of the shop, and we did a little interview in person mm. which That's which cool. is really cool so but uh, you've been on at least a few times with us on the podcast so 
Thank well, you for you all guys, the times you've joined us. No, you guys have a great presence out there. And, and, and I think it's important to have places where fans know that they can go and get some, some really decent, straight information. Well, thank well, you. We try. We try and do that. Do. Um, but I've, I've really taken to viewing all these things that we do as like um, an oral history of the films, you know, talking directly to you guys, um, especially in this sort of age of where we're not getting fucking behind the scenes content on our, on our DVDs and stuff now. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's the way I'm viewing them at the minute. So I always appreciate it when you do take the time to yeah. come and put your perspective and your experience across to, um, no, it's, it's, it's great. Awesome. You know, it's always great to have, uh, have your work appreciated, you know, particularly by people that you, uh, that you respect. So no, it's all great. I love it all. But before we sign off, are there any other thoughts or anecdotes about your time on Prey that you would like to share that we just haven't given you the opportunity to talk about? Hmm. Well, yeah. Where we shot in Calgary it was it was it was it was stunningly beautiful. You know, the landscape and the uh, the vegetation and 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 just the way the uh, uh, there'd be these big cliffs that drop down into rivers that we pass on the way back to our hotel every night, and and, and it was just it was just such a beautiful. Uh, beautiful location. It's kind of it's kind of remarkable. It's something that you think you would you would want to see in some kind of a uh, uh, some kind of an epic movie about um, people trying to traverse the, the the earth and 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 to know that it was part of the background, a very important part of the background of a predator movie is is to me is is uh, I get a kick out of it because who would have expected you could take something so beautiful and something so horrific and have them become have them become part of the same environment. Yeah, definitely was was an awesome setting. And personally, I had always wanted to see a Predator movie in like a mountainous forest region. Because I mean, I live in Utah and I can kind of relate to that a, a bit. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, no, it was very distinct from what we had seen before with like the jungles or the city environment. Well, I'm, I'm hoping the next one shoots in Hawaii. <laughs> Predators had a bit of shooting there, I believe. They did Hawaii yes, and Austin, yes, Texas, did. and they brought oh, really? those two together. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. I, I think it really it, it made the scope of the film look a lot bigger as well. You know, those big vista shots, you know, you don't really see them in any other films. And, you know, there was a perspective going into Prey that it being a Hulu thing meant it was going to be a cheap little kind of film. And then, yeah. then you have... I mean, that's a wrong perspective, but, you know, people equate it to straight to DVDs, which is stupid. But, you know, that that memory still exists. And, and I think, you know, those kind of epic sweeping mountainous background stuff really help push it away from that false perspective. Mm -hmm. it's such a beautiful film. Yeah. And that really helped. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. And again, that was Tom Woodruff Jr. Um, really glad he was able to join us again. And uh, yeah, we were very much looking forward to seeing what he's going to be doing uh, with his own hmm. projects. If you'd like to follow what he's doing, I believe he's uh, his biggest social media presence is probably his Instagram. So if I'm sure if you search Tom Woodruff Jr. on Instagram, you are sure to find his stuff. Um, but if you'd like to follow us, you can always find us on our website, avpgalaxy.net. We have, uh, of course, our podcast there, a lot of different editorial pieces, the latest news on all things Alien and Predator. We're also on all the major social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, Aaron, if people would like to follow you personally, where can they find you? I'm on Twitter at underscore Corporal Hicks. If you'd like to follow me personally, it's just at Ridgetop21 on both Twitter and Instagram. What about the photography channel? Well, that's my own stuff. But if you want me to plug that, I mean, sure. Like, well, I... I'm, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't. <laughs> Do I usually? I mean, I've, I've mentioned my virtual photography stuff. Well, that's what I meant. Before, but, oh, okay. Well, Ridgetop. Well, virtual isn't that all on the same? No, you have three. On, on Instagram, it's different. On Twitter, I just do everything there. It's oh. whatever. I thought you just had the one photography one where you were doing your normal and your virtuals. No, not on Instagram. Okay. It's just but, me not paying enough attention then. But so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we may have more Prey interviews for you. We will see. Um, but until then, this has been Ridgetop. And Corporal Hicks. 
get into the chop. 